Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first session of Splendor Forum. This morning, we're going to be doing Black Mirror meets Biometric Mirror. I'm Dr. Sula Dreyfus. I'm a researcher in the School of Computing and Information Systems at the University of Mel Melbourne. Welcome. Very good of you to come early in the morning. How many of you guys went to comedy here last night? Hands up. Was it fantastic? Good. Yeah, you were laughing. Good. I can see. Pink hair. She's happy. It's good. It's good. So. This morning, despite the sunshine, we're going to step into a dark and dystopian world of sci-fi meets reality. How many of you guys have watched Black Mirror? Hands up. Oh, we got Black Mirror fans. Excellent. Yes, good. Yep. So Black Mirror turns out to be statistically the most binge-watched film, uh, TV series, on Netflix, which means it's a measure of popularity. It's pretty good. It's only had five seasons, 22 episodes, and yet it gets this special acclaim. Today we're going to meet the real world biometric mirror, and we're going to see how sci-fi intersects with reality. We've got really three spectacular guests this morning to talk about it. Dr. Carl. Everyone knows Dr. Carl. A big hand of applause, please, for Dr. Carl. He is the ABC's king of science, an Australian legend. He's looking startled. He's like, who, me? Who, me? <laughs> I'm not worthy. I <laughs> He's an author, a science communicator on Australian radio and television. He appears regularly on the ABC, on Triple J. Who here has heard his broadcasts on Triple J? Hands up. Yep, fantastic. I listen to them regularly. You are my best friends forever, and I love you madly. <laughs> and the others I love almost as much. <laughs> He's great. He is the author of... 45 books, 45 books, and one about to come out on? Uh, it's coming out, it's called Dr. Carl's Random Road Trip Through Science, but this is my first book with augmented reality. So you download the app, you aim the camera at the book, and suddenly you get all sorts of Easter eggs, a term going back to the 1980s and some early computer games where there were hidden features that you didn't know unless you knew exactly where to put your mouse, especially the grey dot. And I would pop a message say, this was written by somebody. So these are more interesting Easter eggs. So you'll be able to see a video of the rock that nearly wiped us out on Halloween 2015. Nearly killed, if it had hit, we would have wiped out between 10 and 50% of the human race. But this is not about me, this is about <laughs> you. <laughs> no, but congratulations on this forth forthcoming work. Um, we also have Niels Wooters over here, raise hand, yes. <laughs> Applause, please, for Niels. Um, Niels is a really interesting character. He is an architect, he also has a PhD in human computer interaction. He's head of research and emerging practices for the Science Gallery in Melbourne. He's a research fellow in the Interaction Design Lab at the University of Melbourne. He promotes the collision between arts and science. And he is originally from Belgium. Uh, he is also a brand new dad. He just had a baby boy in the last month. Fantastic, congratulations. Uh, and one of his other projects, besides Biometric Mirror, of which he is the father as well, uh, <laughs> is a project he's particularly proud of called Stories of Exile, and it's, he's developed a technology to allow refugees to communicate with local communities around them from their refugee shelters. So that's Niels. Brenna Harding, who is joining us from Sydney. Yes, fantastic. She is a 23-year-old actor. She has um, become famous for her roles in critically acclaimed TV series. Um, Puberty Blues, hands up who's seen Puberty Blues. Fantastic series. Great piece of Australian literature as well. Packed to the Rafters, uh, A Place to Call Home, The Code, Talking About Your Generation, Secret City, and of course, Black Mirror's watershed and controversial episode, Archangel. She's been nominated for a Logie Award for Most Outstanding Newcomer, nominated for an AACTA Award for Best Young Actor, and won the 2013 Logie Award for Most Popular New Female Talent. She lives in Sydney. She's also a campaigner for LGBTI rights. She appeared with her mothers before the 2009 New South Wales Parliamentary Inquiry into same-sex adoption reform. She does a lot of live theatre performance, most recently Cloud Street at the Malt House in Melbourne. So welcome. Happy to have you all here. Fantastic. <laughs> so I thought what would you is start um, uh, by speaking with you, Brenna, a little bit about your experience. Um, if you can tell us a little bit about your time filming on Black Mirror, 
what it was like? It's pretty amazing. Um, Black Mirror was my first overseas gig um, and we shot over in Toronto. And I kind of got the job by accident um, because I misinterpreted the audition instructions. The <laughs> Jodie Foster was the director, which was a, a big gag because my mum has a lifelong crush on Jodie Foster and she was incredibly jealous. Um, and I did. I got the audition instructions that said to do two scenes and to do a bit talking to camera. And instead of doing a bit talking to camera just normally, I, de I decided that what she meant was in character. And I devised this whole two minute monologue in character um, and hated her for it. I was like, come on, did I have to do this? This is awful, what an expectation. Anyway, she thought it was really brave and she cast me. <laughs> it wasn't really brave at all. It was very cowardly. I was like, not even gonna do it. Um, and yeah, got the, got the part, which was a big hoot. Um, and yeah, it was amazing. They treat each Black Mirror episode like a film. Um, and so we had quite a long shoot period and quite long shoot days, a lot of budget, um, big crane shots, um, very high tech. Um, Lots of CGI and, and... So what's it like when you do a lot of CGI work? So um, uh, CGI, computer generated imagery, can you tell us a little bit about how that is as an actor? Yeah, so they're, they're kind of, they create templates, art department create templates that you have to use in a scene that, they'll, that will become like a screen for the CGI. So it'll be like a blank gray screen on phones. So they wanted to create these sort of futuristic phones. So they were slightly different to the ones we've got. So I had to practice, they'd have one that had the keypad and I had to practice exactly what I was typing over and over before we did it. And then I'd do it with the gray screen so that when they put the screen on later, I was typing the right things. Um, and they did that with a few different things. I mean, we had the screen that we were using as well. It probably didn't have the most tech stuff out of all the episodes, but um, yeah, it had a fair bit and it just meant you had to be careful about mm -hmm. how so you So can you tell things. us a bit about the plot of Archangel? Right, so Archangel um, is about, it's, uh, there's, a, there's a technology of a grain that um, reoccurs in Black Mirror a few times, which is implanted into the head. This particular grain is used um, for parents to watch over their children. So it implants into the child's brain and uh, you can see out the child's eyes, you can monitor any sort of health issues going on, vitamin levels, things like that, um, exactly where they are at every time. And you can also censor, so they can't see things that would be distressing that raise their adrenaline levels. So something scary is happening or pornography or anything like that gets censored. Um, and Archangel is about a, a mother called Marie who is, um, she's a single mother, she's, a bit overbearing and very protective um, and has an incident with her child when her child's about three where she almost loses her and a friend says you should try this um, archangel tech um, and she gets it implanted in her, her child's mind and is able to you know supervise her child on the swing when she's still in the kitchen because she can just see what's happening and play hide and seek and know exactly where she is and watch where she's looking and that sort of thing um, but it reaches a point where the censorship um, means that um, her child has this fascination with her own blood and things like that because when she cuts herself she can't see the blood that's coming out because it gets censored um, and so Marie ends up putting the tech away um, and then it comes back later when um, Sarah the version that I play is 15 um, and as you can imagine it gets a little bit worrying uh, the sort of things that she's overseeing um, and the way that that affects their relationship and the invasion of privacy that that leads to. Um, but I won't spoil it. Well, just not too much spoiling it, but I am interested. So at one stage, your character goes off with a boyfriend? Indeed, yes. <laughs> and the mother can see what's going on. Exactly. Um, and that has some In the back of a panel van, which seems to be my thing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's a little disturbing. Yeah, absolutely. And a big violation. I mean, it's bad enough having your parents walk in on you in, in any sort of sexual context, let alone watching without your consent, um, through your, without your consent or knowledge, through your own eyes. I think uh, someone's trying to find this phone. Should we give it to them? Yeah. Oh, that's <laughs> who just it. We have a random person oh. phone here. It's such a cake. Oh. <laughs> oh. There you go. Very good. Located. <laughs> 
So I think you had a, um, you were saying you were talking to someone not long ago who was talking about uh, tracking their own child very casually. He said, oh, I know. Oh, yeah. No, there was someone on set, one of the crew on set, we were having like a conversation one day and she was talking about how she uses Find My iPhone to track her teenage daughter because she's got like the password. So she can just like be like to her, she was said one night, she was like to her daughter, oh, where are you? What are you up to? And she's like, oh yeah, I'm still at my friend's place. And then she checked and she'd gone to the service station to get like a Slurpee or something. And the mum knew. But instead of like saying anything, she just like keeps that in the bank and like maybe we'll bring it up one day or whatever. Like, so she has access still. And I mean, I know people who do that with the consent of their child and so they can just check where their, their children are. But like that, I was like, really? And you're working on this episode and you've read the script and you see how it ends, which is very badly. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, and she saw no moral quandary, no query. Well, I don't know. I guess she was, was kind of just like I'm entitled to as a parent, you know. When you and that's, I guess, an entitlement maybe parents feel or something. Uh, if they, you know, raise someone and house someone and uh, are responsible for someone, then maybe then they should have access to this additional information. I guess it it raises the question which the episode raises about like when someone has their own personhood and when it is okay for a parent to look over. Because when you're talking about a six-month-old child, probably fine for you to track their whereabouts at all times. They're completely dependent on you. So where is that line when you shouldn't be invading their privacy in that particular way? And I think that's a question that parents have to ask without the tech, but the tech just brings it to the fore. Um, so you're no stranger to controversy. Um, your first uh, on-screen appearance was very controversial. Yeah. Can uh, she was star of Play School? Can you <laughs> Through tell the window segment, one time. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell us Not about star. your starring moment and why it was controversial? Oh, I mean, it wasn't very controversial from, from my perspective. I just thought it was a really great day out. I was in a through the window segment. I think it was the arch window. Um, and we got to go to... <laughs> yeah, very good. Um, possibly my Fond career memories. highlight. Fond memories, the audience, yeah. <laughs> but um, they gave us a media pass to, Alice, uh, to Wonderland at the time, which was an amusement park in Sydney. And I got to bring my best mate and we had the best day. You just had to flash your media pass and you went round and round and round. I was like eight. It was like the coolest thing. <laughs> Um, but my, my two lesbian mothers happened to come along um, and there was one shot of them holding hands in the background while the focus was meant to be on me. Um, and yeah, parents were really upset about it and um, you know, complained to the ABC and John Howard was commenting and that sort of thing. So and what did John Howard say? In oh, his that it shouldn't, shouldn't be a thing. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> sexualizing so. children was the was the thing that was said by having your two parents hold hands yes. on play school. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So so, uh, so that's obviously a little 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 bit concerning. And um, yeah. from that, you've gone on to take a bit of an activist role. Yeah. Yeah. Something I'm really interested in. Um, and do you have concerns about the implications for technology and? Um, facial recognition and scanning technology, particularly vis-a-vis -vis your areas of interest in activism, and what might those concerns be? Yeah, well, I think that my main concern with the technology, which is now trying to scan me, go away. Um, <laughs> um, There's more to come. We'll be scanning <laughs> Brenna shortly. Yes, Stick around. Not yet. <laughs> um, is, I mean, this particular tech, which you will all learn about soon, um, I think, because it takes the um, sort of opinions and assessments of real people and then creates an algorithm that feeds back information through the tech that reflects what this whole lot of people have to say. I think that my main concern is that it legitimises biases that humans already have and can perpetuate them in the algorithm. Um, so whether they be racist biases or homophobic biases. Um, and Do you think the tech um, makes it somehow uh, a irrefutable truth? Yeah, well, I think it gives people um, a, like a, a arm's distance from their own like discrimination. Um, they don't have to take as much ownership over it because they can say that it's the tech and not them or point the finger there to legitimise it. It gives them sort of a cover or an out to their own negative, um, possibly harmful opinions. 
It doesn't really uh, necessarily enforce self-reflection the way a conversation with a human. No, might. not at all. Mm. Not at all. I'm not really. I'm not really that into tech. I'm kind of a bit wary of it in general. Um, and yeah, it worries me. Do you worry? Just before we get to Neil's, do you worry about the impact of tech on young people? Yeah. Well, I definitely think it's changing the way that we interact and the, the way that we interact with the world. Um, I can't say that I find social media to be a particularly enriching thing in my life, besides keeping all my events in one place, which is quite helpful. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's changing the way that we um, perceive ourselves and others, and the way that we um, put ourselves out into the world. Um, yeah, I, I do. Feel so, so, so it's been said that uh, young people are losing the art of conversation because they're on their phones so much. Would you agree or disagree? Um, I think that there's probably different parts of our brains that are being developed because of social media and because of the way that we interact with technology that were never there before. Mm -hmm. Perhaps maybe the art of conversation, but there's probably the art of many other things that are being developed. Um, and I think that you know, the art of, of skillful online conversation or online debate or you know, processing a whole lot of information from different places is probably being developed. It's just a, it's a different way. But I'm a big fan of being in person because I feel like um, it's a, a better environment for empathy and understanding. You can really show that you're listening in person um, and break through and make changes, especially as a, a feminist and an activist. That's really important to me, to be able to get through to someone who you don't necessarily agree with. And I don't feel like that there's much room for that online, as I'm sure all of you have been aware of, of conversations on posts where people are just not listening to each other and calling each other out and there's no progression there's no sort of end point to that conversation um, yeah. and I think yeah in person that doesn't exist as much and I don't think that the online space has replicated that yeah. empathy and listening that you can get in person yet well to tell us more about that Niels can you tell us what is biometric mirror and how did it come to be how did it come to be who has heard of biometric mirror just a quick show of hands. Oh, wow. We're almost as big as Black Mirror. Um, no, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> um, I think it came about because of sort of things that are happening in the facial recognition and um, ethics space globally. Um, there's a lot of things happening currently in China, for instance, that are quite inspiring from a research perspective, but obviously really shocking from a, from a social and societal point of view. Um, and just to give that context, what China is doing at the moment is developing this nationwide um, facial recognition system as well as a social credit system. So every single citizen has a score. So it's, it's literally a number that's attached to your individual identity and it tracks your behavior in society. Buy a lot of beer, um, so a festival like Splendor is probably not a good example, but buy a lot of beer and you lose points. Buy nappies because you're a parent, in my case, for instance, and you gain points. Um, I probably gained a lot of points in the past six weeks, so that's great. Um, it's very similar to an episode of Black Mirror, knows I know, that. Yeah, yeah. E exactly. Um, and I think Black Mirror was probably a way for us to start to understand what China was doing, because it's only since then that it became uh, yeah, publicly discussed in Western countries that what China is doing is, yeah, is not the way forward. So we, we basically took inspiration from that um, and we noticed that obviously this is going in a totally wrong direction. Um, there's no transparency around how these algorithms work. So what we did is we just downloaded um, a public facial recognition and facial analysis data set. Um, it's publicly available for research purposes. It's a, a collection of about 10,000 photos, I think. Um, and every single photo has been annotated has been crowdsourced, um, so we know exactly how each individual face looks like in terms of attractiveness, in terms of their responsibility or perceived responsibility, um, gender, ethnicity, um, yeah, aggressiveness, but down to really awkward things as well, like emotional instability. Um, weirdness. Weirdness, absolutely. <laughs> Um, and all of that comes in flat files. What we did is we just transformed that into a machine learning model. And that gives us something really powerful because now all of a sudden we can take a photo of Dr. <laughs> Carl and of Brenna, for instance, and compare that with our data set that lives in the cloud. And we get an understanding of what other people would think about you if they were to see you walking down uh, yeah, a major shopping street in the city, for instance. How many days of human programming did it take to create the biometric mirror? Wild guess, Zulet? Yes, wild guess. 
Can you do a wild guess? Can oh, you make no, a wild I guess? have no <laughs> idea. I have right, no idea. Okay. You take a wild guess. Well, literally, the machine learning model, I trained that myself. And as you said, I'm an architect. Mm -hmm. um, I have a bit of background in computer science, but I'm not an AI expert whatsoever. It took me one hour to create that <laughs> algorithm. And I think that's really scary, the fact that AI has now become so accessible and so user-friendly mm -hmm. without any mechanisms in place to raise awareness to the developer, like, hey, what you're doing is actually not right, or hey, what you're doing can be used for this or for that purpose, which is, which is not all right. Mm -hmm. um, and then the development of the app surprisingly took way longer. It took us a couple of weeks to develop an app around that, um, which we brought with us today as well. Um, and so this is the first time Biometric Mirror has come to Splendor, but not the first time that it's gone on a plane flight. No, exactly. Um, we were given a very exciting opportunity a couple of weeks ago. Um, Biometric Mirror actually traveled to the country where this all started. Um, it went to China. Um, and it was exciting. We were invited by the World Economic Forum to present Biometric Mirror at their annual event in China. Um, so it's a bit like the Davos of uh, of Asia, so they invite all the Asian uh, ministers and business leaders to their event. Um, and basically, yeah, we were given that opportunity to present it there. Um, really interesting, but also really interesting from a, a communications perspective, I suppose. The university was, A, really keen to do it, mm -hmm. massive exposure, but at the same time, they forced us through this uh, really complex risk assessment procedure, um, because obviously you don't want things to go wrong. Um, and initially we thought we were clever. We were like, oh, we'll send one of our Chinese students over as well so that he, he can help with communicating what Biometric Mirror is about. And uh, yeah, apparently that was a big red flag for the university. He said, don't send a Chinese student along with Biometric Mirror. If someone gets in trouble, it'll be the Chinese student with a Chinese passport. So do you find that um, a Biometric Mirror is often wrong? <laughs> I think a better question is, do you think, do we think that it's often right? Um, <laughs> look, I'll leave that up to the audience to decide and to our scan victims to decide. Um, yeah. Um, okay, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about um, uh, what it's doing, but we might cut now for a little bit to a chat to Dr. Carl about it. Um, are you worried, Dr. Carl, about what the implications are of something like Biometric Mirror, and do you see there is a growth in the use of facial recognition software everywhere around society? So by Biometric Mirror, the device, the camera with the AI, scans your face and body, but face, and then presumably does a character analysis mm -hmm. and picks up things such as kindness, weirdness, ability to pat little kittens and that sort of stuff, right? And we're supposed to believe that this incredibly complex range of characteristics that make up a human can be picked up by somebody with one hour's work. Is that <laughs> it? Yeah, just like that. Right. So on the way up in the car last night, uh, travelling at the same speed uh, in the car, my radar, my, the radar told me that I was doing anything over a five kilometre per hour range of speed and that should be so easy to get accurate to within a thousandth of a kilometre per hour. So something as simple as my speed, it got wrong by 5%. We're trying to say that the human psyche with all of its complexities can be just read by a machine. Well, on one hand, Coco Chanel, as we know from fashion, and therefore she's a goddess, um, <laughs> And my daughter did help design Serena Williams' bra when she was working at uh, Burley. So I'm big on fashion. Coco Chanel said a very wise thing. She said, at 20, you have the face that God gave you. And at 50, you have the face that you deserve. <laughs> Which is a reflection of what you've done and what sort of person you've turned into. If you spend a lot of time sneering or being happy or loving people. So is there any compensation for that? I'm being a little bit sceptical here, but you're saying, have you factored that in the age of the person? Well, that's a really good question, and I think it's totally right that you're very sceptical. Um, to tell a bit more about how it works, it's really a snapshot of people's face at that specific moment in time, so it does obviously not take into account your history or your how you looked in your 20s uh, versus in your 40s. None of that. It's literally just a single snapshot. Okay, well, if we look at two politicians in Australia, 
we would have Peter Dutton, who is remarkably good at showing 0% of what he's thinking, whereas we have Scott Morrison. And just do the fun thing of getting different photos of Scott Morrison and then looking at his smile. And one side goes up and one goes horizontal and down, and he does this differently with different sides of his face. And if you do the fun game of then getting his left and right face and then pick the left and then double that and then the right and double that, you get half a dozen, dozen different personalities popping up and we have no idea how many of them are real because he's... He's a politician. Well, he, he may, he's heading down to being as skilled as you are in terms of <laughs> acting and actually <laughs> acting the role out. So which personality are you going to give today <laughs> under the camera? Um, the, the, the kind... Com out. Okay. We'll so what was the second part of the question? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think we should actually uh, jump in and do the scan of Brennan. Okay, so am I in the right place or should I move over? Yep, we'll just see. Do we need... Um, yep, so Brennan, if you leave okay, so I'll in. Move over. I'm moving over. And while we're... Uh, okay. Here. We are now besties. Yeah. Right. We're going to... We're gonna, you might have to snuggle in there a little bit. Let's let a few lean back a little bit. Yes, I can just move well, actually my aim the camera. chair. Oh. We shifted the camera. Instead of shifting us. <laughs> <laughs> We're high Genius, tech. genius. There you go. We're going to give you a Bible to swear on in just a minute. <laughs> yeah, now you can see the attributes. I don't know if I'm sitting in the way of any of you to be able to see. But they'll start to come up uh, and it'll show her gender. And give our poor little laptop a little bit of patience. He's suffering from the travel. Um, <laughs> Can I keep my hand up? No, you can ha lower your hand. Um, secretly, this is a, a workout tool as well. A lot of people keep their hands up <laughs> and like, lower and raise them again, which is great. Now, you guys know you'll all be able to try Biometric Mirror to be scanned yourself in the science tent. There are a bunch of sessions listed today, tomorrow, and Sunday uh, on the My Splendor app. You can see them. So they, it has correctly picked that you are female, although it, of course, raises questions, well, doesn't Well, I want to question that as well. Um, so our AI is trained on only two gender identities, uh -huh. male and female, which is a very traditional viewpoint. Um, and I think as a society, we've progressed beyond that mm -hmm. uh, thinking. And that's really interesting. Do we want to build an AI that identifies every possible gender identity. I think it's technically really complicated because, it, because it's no longer physiological. Um, and I think we, yeah, we need to question that. But how much of this, in a sense, is about the problem between um, how we define ourselves and what the freedom to, find, to define ourselves versus <laughs> how a programmer says we should be? <laughs> Love the dreadlocks. <laughs> Professional actor, uh, you, you're you rock. <laughs> oh, you're very kind. So, can you tell us about the column on the far right there, Niels? Yeah. Um, so, a lot of people might think that, for instance, in this case, the algorithm thinks that Brenna is 91% happy, but that's not the case. 96 African. 96% <laughs> African. <laughs> But it's really interesting. We've, we've specifically designed it this way to cause confusion and to make people think really carefully about what's actually shown on a screen. Mm -hmm. So really the algorithm only says that um, Brenna is, for instance, not at all, not responsible at all. And the algorithm is 90% sure that Brenna she is, is low not responsible. responsibility. Exactly. Okay, okay. Um, and it's, but it's only 14% sure that she's highly sociable. Yeah, I think the algorithm might have made a mistake there. I don't, but I think the rest is probably, <laughs> is but, probably but, right. But, but Brenna is a professional actor. And she can do things that the rest of us cannot. Well, so that's an interesting question. How much can an actor actually um, fake this system, Niels? Oh, even, <laughs> I, even I can fake it. And I'm an academic, so I'm definitely not an actor. Um, a Monday morning versus a Friday afternoon, the result is very different for me because I have a stubble. So apparently on a Friday afternoon, I'm, I'm way more aggressive than on a Monday morning. Um, that's strange because on a Monday morning, I need my coffee. Um, yeah, so you can fake it. Put on glasses, put on a hat, put on a cap, um, change 
even the lighting conditions in a space. So I suspect we're pretty well lit here, but then there's a dark background. I suspect that's why, Brenna, why you're supposedly African today. Um, or maybe it's the balloons behind you, or you have a weird <laughs> excrescence growing out of your left ear. So I think, yeah, all of these things, we've, we've designed it for a reason, because we want to raise I awareness. <laughs> Um, yeah, we want to raise awareness that a lot of this technology is still in its infancy and we need to be really careful with how we use it. Um, and we probably also need to be really transparent about how it's being used. And to, to build upon what we, told about, what we talked about before in China, um, so you saw the scenario that briefly popped up. Um, so apparently Brenna is highly aggressive. I haven't seen that today. Um, <laughs> but imagine that's being used against you. Mm. Imagine that put something in place or put something in motion whereby all of your information is passed on to law enforcement and all of a sudden they can track your movements. Um, it might sound like science fiction and it, that's also how we write it down in Biometric Mirror, but it's actually not. Uh, China is doing it and I don't know if many people saw the Four Corners report earlier this week um, about what's happening in Xinjiang um, with facial recognition and how it's being used to oppress a, a Muslim minority group in that region. It's really scary. It's, it's, it's just genocide 2.0. What methods are being used? What technology is being used? So it's very similar to what they're doing across China. They've rolled out this massive surveillance network. Um, but so you're walking down the street, you're just scanned, you don't even know it. You don't even know it. You're constantly being scanned. You have to go through checkpoints. If, you're, um, if you happen to be a member of the Uyghur community, apparently your face is photographed by force, so you can't even opt in or opt out. Um, it's just done, and it's scanned in three dimensions as well. Um, yeah, and it gives systems so much information. Now, the really scary thing is that Australian researchers are involved in their practices. Um, so a researcher from Curtin University as well as from UTS, um, they're heavily involved. They've actually developed an algorithm that can distinguish a Uyghur community member from, I think it's a Korean um, ethnicity and then a Nepalese ethnicity. Um, the response from the university is really interesting because they say, look, uh, our academics only provide technical advice, but if you look at the publications that they wrote, so that specific academic is, first of all, the lead author on a pretty significant publication, um, has received funding from the Chinese government to develop that research. Yeah, it just, it's just so unethical. Does that freak you out, Dr. Carl? Well, I, I heard of a case of where a Chinese citizen in Shanghai was crossing the road illegally against a red light. And as they were crossing the road, their phone went bing bong saying messages arrived. When they got to the other side, they had already received their fine for crossing against a red light. And help me on this one, I'm guessing that firstly, there was some sort of facial recognition so that the camera on the red light uh, picked up that there was this person with that face and I'm guessing, I'm speculating, that there might have been some sort of geotagging to the phone. So this face is in the middle of the road illegally. The phone belonging to this face mm -hmm. is in the phone. Let's take a guess, there, that is a person and before he got to the other pavement he had already been fined. Wow. Okay, number one. Number two, I think about five weeks ago 13 million people in China, which is roughly half the population of Australia, lost enough social credit that they are no longer allowed to travel on any form of transport other than walk. They can't travel on bus or train or aeroplane or car. Mm. That's their punishment for buying too much beer and not enough nappies. I'm just warning you, Brenna, you've got to buy some more nappies. You know, so, wow. so and this is the kind of system that may well be brought into Australia with universal surveillance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You mentioned a few good books about this with surveillance in their title. Yeah, and, and to build upon that, I think in Australia we're not too far off. Um, so there's a few cities that have implemented very similar systems. Um, if not similar systems, they're using exactly the same manufacturer and supplier as the suppliers in China. Um, I won't mention the brands here, but I suspect some of you will have a phone of that specific brand. Um, it's pretty scary. 
the fact that we don't seem to shy away anymore of that. And I think it's because this idea of surveillance, it's such an economically interesting um, thing to sell to people. Wouldn't you want to feel secure in your own community? Obviously, we all want to feel secure, but do we then want to sacrifice every single freedom and every single aspect of our own privacy? Yeah. As an example, um, I was talking to some people at the international airport, just having a chat with the security people, um, and they told me of a case where a mother and daughter were coming into Australia, and one of them had both their passports, and accidentally the passports got swapped over. The mother walked through on the daughter's passport, and the system said that that was the right person. But when the daughter tried to walk through with the mother's passport, it said it wasn't. So straight away the system can be fooled that easily that it can swap over of, of people who are you know, genetically related to each other. So the system's certainly not perfect. I, I got into this sort of biometric stuff about 15 years ago when, as soon as I discovered that you could buy a fin fingerprint front door lock, I got one. And they've gradually died over the years, and I'm into my third generation, and it's not as good as the ones on the smartphones, but it kind of works, and it means we don't have to carry a key. So I've already walked into it. Um, and then with being scanned everywhere, there was that famous case in Arkansas in a court case in 2017, no, 2018, where two years earlier, a bunch of men had got together to watch football and drink beer, which happens, and some of them drank too much beer, and in the morning, a terrible thing, one of them was found dead in the, in, in the swimming pool face down. And there was an accusation that the host had murdered them, and they went back to the records, and, and, and this event happened in 2015. They went back to Amazon, forced Amazon to open up the records of Alexa. Alexa apparently responds only when you say, hey, Alexa, do something. But they found that Amazon had recorded everything. And even though the Alexa unit was in another room, it had recorded the conversation, and enough came through that indicated that the host had not murdered the uh, person who died. It was just they got too drunk and fell over. Mm -hmm. And just this week, I heard, uh, I read that now Google has a human listen to 0.2% of every single conversation that happens near a Google home and near a Google mini. So it's not just the algorithm trying to say, oh, your accent's a bit weird, we'll adjust it, but rather there's a human being each day listening to two out of every thousand things that it picks up when you, and, and not when you say, hey, Google, but when you say, look, I asked you to buy some meat pies on the way home and you forgot, so now I've got to have healthy food. That sucks, right? So we're continually being monitored, uh, facial, all over the place. So I think um, San Francisco recently decided to reject facial recognition software widely in use uh, all over the city by law enforcement. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, because I think it's a great example, San Francisco being the tech hub Globally, um, all of a sudden, so city council decided not to have facial recognition systems across their um, yeah, urban realm. Um, it's, it's based on what London has experienced, so the Met Police. And look, London, uh, the UK in general, they've has this long tradition of surveillance networks. Uh, the UK has always been pretty much the example uh, in terms of surveillance cameras. Um, they recently rolled out a system, a facial recognition system, um, almost similar to China, because people have been forcibly scanned as well. Um, but the accuracy of that system was seemingly like 4%. Um, four, 40? No, no, 4. I zero, think four. zero, 4. 4 out of 100. <laughs> 4 out of 100. So you're going to jail, right, as in okay, fair enough. Inaccurate. Um, if I were to try and publish a paper, or you, um, and our results indicate a 4% accuracy, then yeah, <laughs> it, I hope that it wouldn't get in anywhere. Yet. The Met Police made a case for it and um, they've rolled it out across the city, but it was enough information for the San Francisco City Council to actually make an informed decision and say, this technology is just still in its infancy, we're not doing this, um, and that's great. I think it's a really interesting precedent. Um, I can only hope that a lot more cities uh, embrace that idea. So um, just before we come to scan Dr. Carl on Biometric Mirror, um, uh, I'd also point out that there is already scanning that occurs in a set of cities in Australia, including, uh, I know, Melbourne, there is scanning that occurs, yes. Um, uh, and I don't think it's terribly public, 
Um, and it is done for public safety, but it does beg the question of, are we happy to do this without consent? Now, one use for it is you go to an airport and it's been trialed that you might not need a boarding pass. You're gonna board a flight, there'll be a scan of your face, and you'll be able to just walk on the plane without ever having to print out that pesky boarding pass uh, and get fined $20 if you don't. Um, but there's an example of a trade-off on the convenience versus the risk to privacy. Did you want to say something before we scan you, Dr. Carl? Well, you use the two words, public safety. Let me point out in Australia that more people every single year for the last 40 years, every year more people are killed in ladder accidents than by terrorists. My question to Peter Dutton, yeah, yeah. where are the ladder police? I want <laughs> ladder police everywhere. Exactly. We're building an AI to, to solve that. <laughs> oh, well, if it's got more than half a percent accuracy, it must be 100% correct. All right, let's see if we can turn the biometric mirror to Dr. Carl and scan him. And guys, can we keep, um, can we keep uh, the scan of Dr. Carl up? on the screen? No, we can't. Okay, you'll have to read really uh, quickly. I'm going to have to come okay, let's see if we can get it. Will we just swap positions yeah. for a second? Yeah. Do I get balloons growing out of my head? Is that <laughs> going to confuse things? One of the interesting things that happened in the UK is the uh, police are out in, I think, maybe close to a dozen different uh, uh, spots, and they were scanning people on the footpath as they walked down the footpath, doing facial recognition um, and uh, scanning pedestrians, and in one case, a pedestrian put a scarf over his face. It was also a cold day, he might have just had his scarf there because he was cold, uh, and the police stopped him and said, why are you covering your face? And he refused to take the scarf off. Now, he hadn't been done doing anything wrong, police no reason to charge him. They fined him 90 pounds, 90 pounds for actually wearing a scarf over his face and refusing to be scanned involuntarily. Here we go. Apparently biometric mirror thinks that Dr. Carl is not a human. <laughs> okay, it is true that I am part of the world conspiracy of world leaders where we are all shape-changing reptiles from the planet Zog. Okay, <laughs> I'm putting it out there. I'm a little bit closer. Sorry, I'm sorry. I'll try the other hand. Try the other hand, yeah. Do you worry, Niels, about this is this technology being used, for example, for people who might want to apply for jobs in the future? Well, if you look at how biometric mirror works today, I'm very concerned. Um, <laughs> but in general, yes, absolutely. Um, and that's the rationale behind biometric mirror. There's so there's this lack of understanding among a lot of people how AI is being used or why it's being used or what it's being used for or what it should not be used for. So what we did with Biometric Mirror, we let people scan themselves and we present them this speculative scenario. It's, uh, oh, there we go. Suddenly you turn human. Uh -huh. My powers are the great. things that happen on a Friday morning. Um, so we've, we have a list of speculative scenarios. What if your employer or your recruiter excludes you from management positions because you're perceived to be too aggressive or too irresponsible? What if all of a sudden tabloids can publish all of your photos because you appear to be highly attractive? Um, what if you're um, forced to take up counselling by your insurer because you're perceived to be um, emotionally un unstable or very weird? All of these things, they might, like I said before, they might sound strange and they might sound far-fetched, but they're actually not. Insurers are already doing these things. They are forcing people to yeah, pay a more significant fee because their driving behaviour is s seemingly quite aggressive. It's the royal way from Dr. Carl. <laughs> yes, continue. There you go. Hopefully we get this. Carl seems to use his humanness. <laughs> so does it mean that it also might be used for other things? And, and to some degree, is online dating kind of a precursor to it? But maybe with these augmented elements um, providing a different way of analysing our would-be future partners and spouses. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a lot of research as well, because now that you start talking about dating, there's this American researcher, Michael Kaczynski, from, I think, Stanford, 
who scraped photos from dating websites and basically developed this AI gaydar, um, which is extremely controversial research for obvious reasons. Um, but he what does it do? Well, so he scraped, I think it's a few million photos from dating websites, and he has uh, basically, he concluded that there is this average gay face and the average straight face. Like, really? <laughs> uh -huh. Sorry, Carl. Lower your hand again and raise your hand again. Having a little trouble with Dr. Carl. We do have a video having scanned him earlier, so we, we know the truth about Dr. Carl. <laughs> We can play that if we need to, but hopefully we can get it to work. There we go. <laughs> That's the earlier scan. Should we go with this? We might go with this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, okay. So we scanned Dr. Carl earlier, and as you will see, um, there wasn't a lot of confidence in the fact that uh, Biometric Mirror said that they gave his value as male, um, and that his age was 70, and that he too is African. Um, uh, his, his happiness, 100% sure, I like biometric mirrors, 100% sure that his emotion is happiness. Um, he is, however, apparently not that kind. He's got low kindness and low happiness um, at 60, 66%, <laughs> which is fairly amusing. Uh, his commonness is average. Um, and which is kind of an interesting comparison itself to be averagely common. Uh, <laughs> his level of responsibility is average, but only a confidence level of 47%. He's got a low attractiveness. Dr. Carl, how wrong biometric mirror is. Um, and that's a 64% confidence. His sociability is high and biometric mirror is very sure that he is sociable. His introversion is also high, <laughs> but it's 50-50 uh, odd there. Um, he's got high aggressiveness. You are aggressive, Dr. Carl. But he's not weird. <laughs> um, but he's got low weirdness. Wow, Biometric Mirror got that very wrong, very I'm, wrong. I'm, I'm, I'm doubting it only on that one. Everything else is 100% true, but I'm definitely weird. <laughs> And his emotional stability is average, although biometric mirror is only 37% sure. Is, is it possible that this, we've both got this high African rating and high aggressiveness rating. Is it possible that this is reflecting uh, racial discrimination in the data? I was actually just going to mention that. So the fact that you're both African and not happy, uh, not attractive and highly aggressive, it's because you're African. Wow. And I haven't said this myself, but it's just captured in the data. Uh, our data has been crowdsourced in the US. Uh, we've used a system called Mechanical Turk. It allows you to acquire a lot of crowdsourced information in a relatively short amount of time and for relatively, yeah, cheap. Um, so Mechanical Turk is known to be relatively biased, so it attracts a lot of young men, typically unemployed or with not much that educational background behind them. So if you ask them to look at photos of people and classify them, you're obviously just going to capture what society thinks of particular subgroups. Um, and that's really shocking. And, and I think what we also seem to forget sometimes is that AI builds upon massive amounts of crowdsourced information. So if you feed the system rubbish, the output's only going to be rubbish. Uh, now, you, you mentioned this mechanical Turk. And so, on one hand, we think, well, it's on a computer, so it must be 100% true. And then it turns out it was actually written by somebody using an AI for one hour um, rather than one month. And then it turns out that it's based on data. Let me just ask a question here, a bit of an example. So, many surveys that um, <coughs> appear in various newspapers uh, are built upon people who specialise in earning money by answering surveys. And you can put your name down, and for each answer you get, you get maybe two cents. So these people special, and there's a close-off window. And if you start on the window, and uh, you might have to spend half an hour, and if you spend 29 minutes and they close it off, you've wasted that time. So these people who earn their income by answering surveys on the web are really good at answering them quickly. Who cares about actually reading the subtleties of A, B, or C? Is bang, 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 I've got five cents. So you're basing this system upon people who 
you said a mostly unemployed male who want to earn five cents for 15 yeah. minutes work. Yeah, absolutely. What could possibly go wrong? Totally, yeah. But have you had interest expressed in buying Biometric Mirror for commercial yes. purposes? Absolutely, and that's really interesting. So we've been very upfront about the purpose of our research. We've never said that we've developed this magnificent AI that can analyze your psychometrics and it'll replace every single psychologist in Australia. We've been really upfront in saying that we, we have developed a rubbish system to question our thinking about ethics and about AI and, and the consequences for society. Yet, after a couple of days, we started to receive these emails from companies overseas as well as national, and three of them, if I'm not mistaken, were recruitment companies that actually had a sincere interest in buying this technology, so exactly this crappy system that thinks that Carl is a 70-year-old African, uh, highly aggressive male. With low weirdness. With low weirdness. Low, yeah. low attractiveness. <laughs> And that's really shocking because we've been transparent um, about how it works, but recruitment companies would not be, well, no company would be because they can conceal themselves behind IP claims. They don't have to be transparent. And that's, that's super scary. Can you mention the work of, now I did something with her, she's brilliant, Ellen Broad and her book Made by Humans? Yeah, so Ellen and, and a lot of authors in that same realm, they start talking indeed about the consequences of AI. And, and her book, her title is so great, Made by Humans, and that's what we often forget. AI is still made by humans, and humans make mistakes. Humans are biased. Humans sometimes have no morale or no ethical constructs behind them. And I think that's what we often forget. So she gives the example of a facial recognition system for giving access into a company uh, of 500,000 workers and the majority of the workers are black but the people doing the program are white and the program works perfectly well in all the testing on the white people. When they try to use it on a real day, in comes a person of a different skin colour and suddenly they can't get in. How could they have made that mistake, not realise it? And then when they're trying to train the system to work in medical diagnosis, to look at an x-ray and diagnose the condition known as a pneumothorax, where there's air between the inside of your ribcage and the lungs. In every single photo they trained it on, there was a pneumothorax. And because the person was still alive, the reason that they were alive was that there was a big fat tube going through their chest wall sucking the air out. And so in real life, it couldn't diagnose the pneumothorax because there wasn't any big fat tube already in the chest. So you've got a person with a pneumothorax, you give it to the AI and say, oh my God, um, look at this x-ray, do they have a pneumothorax? Instead of looking at it, it says, no, nah, because there's no big fat tube and then they die. Well, it's a really good example and even more mainstream, I think, is a lot of cameras have these automated white balance settings. White balance settings as well, they are trained on Caucasian or Asian um, yeah, skin tones. So it's really difficult to get the white balance right for African people, which is really shocking and really scary. And that's just mainstream. That's been the case now for 20, probably even 30 years, and, and no one really thinks about it anymore. So one thing I'm really interested in is you said when Biometric Mirror went to China, you were saying to me before off stage that uh, more people sought to be scanned. 2,000 people, was it? Yeah. So then we had, we're actually at the conference. Yeah, we had 3,000 people come through and there were only 1,500 people. And that's really interesting. People actually come back to Biometric Mirror because they want to be re-scanned. Um, we've had it at Melbourne Uni where people yeah, just change something in their clothing or change their appearance slightly to see how the system, what the system thinks about them. And for, for a few people, I think that happens because they have a sincere interest in how it works and whether they can manipulate the system. But we're also conscious that for a lot of people, it's because they felt harmed by the initial scan and they just wanted to yeah, start to feel better, I suppose. And you had a particular group of visitors who at first alarmed you and then surprised you by all <laughs> the troping up to it with a po-faced expression? Yeah, we had a, suddenly we had a Chinese police squad rock up for biometric mirroring when we were in China. Uh, now, I wasn't there. I was probably changing nappies along the way, but colleagues of mine were there, and they reported live that that was a pretty scary thing to see because all of a sudden there were these 10 or 12 Chinese police officers, you can imagine, pretty stern-looking and, uh, yeah, not the kind of people you want to have a conversation with, really, about AI and ethics. 
Um, but seemingly they just wanted to do biometric mirror. They all of a, all of a sudden they stood in line, waited patiently, saw their readout, but didn't smile at all. Police officers in China, you should probably smile. possibly not high on the weirdness uh, factor. You think we were not allowed to document anything, so we have no data. Um, but yeah, and also it was a Mandarin version of biometric mirror that we specifically developed for the event. Uh, and I don't think our team was very proficient in Mandarin. Um, how much, Brenna, if you can tell us through your activism, in what ways do you think this sort of thing might be used against um, the LBGTI community in things, in ways that we don't see? So, for example, I'm thinking of, you know, more recently when you apply to a job, one of the big recruitment companies will make you do a video, a three-minute video or whatever, that sort of thing. Do you worry about the sort of fake phrenology behind this, this old hundred year old thing if we can measure your scale and tell you know, measure your head and tell if you're a criminal or whatever being used in ways that we don't expect. Yeah, I mean it's what I was talking about before. It allows you to legitimize um, human discrimination um, and using it in things like recruitment or anything, an entry into a place, whatever it might be, and saying it's the system's fault and not the human's fault mean, it means that people don't have to take accountability for their own biases and their own discriminations. So that is something that I worry about with that. So we might open the floor up to questions. Do you guys have some questions you want to throw out to the panel? Um, hands up. Yep, just a fellow. Do we have a bouncing um, microphone cube? Yes, we oh do. My God, the bouncing microphone. Yes. Get ready to catch it. <laughs> okay, so we have a gentleman here in the Hawaiian shirt, I think. Okay. Hello. Uh, I just wanted to make sure, are you capturing any information from anyone who uses the biometric mirror at Splendor? Any data? Very good question. Um, we used to. <laughs> we used to until we went to China, and from then onwards, we shut down. Uh, we shut off any data capture. The only thing we capture is the number of people that interact, but nothing else. Um, but previously, we did capture a lot of data. We captured your biometric mirror, but your biometric readout. Sorry, as well as the photo that we used to analyze you, as well as a photo taken at every single step of the interaction. The idea for us was, um, and we had ethics clearance for this, the idea behind this was that we wanted to study how people's emotion changed over time. Um, and we had a sample set of about 10,000 scans until we went to China. And actually it made clear to us that there's no point in analyzing it. Um, you have two different kinds of people that respond. First of all, you have the people that see it as a joke, so they actually become happier as the readout becomes harsher. And you've got the people that get really upset if the readout gets quite upsetting. So yeah, there's no point in analyzing that. It's just as ridiculous as making an AI that reads people's psychometrics. And just to be clear, Niels, what's your intent with the data that you had collected? You will be not on selling it anywhere. I we see. will definitely not on sell it. No, totally. But on the other hand, if you were to set up a little sub company, maybe Brianna, Brianna and I, and then we could then take care of selling it to recruitment companies and we'll give you half the proceeds. And you wouldn't have to have the ethic, ethical responsibility. Well, yeah. Actually, I've been chatting with... Outsource ethics. <laughs> Outsource yeah. ethics. We'll, we'll sell our ethics for half a billion dollars. I've been, I've been chatting with a, a colleague researcher and we've developed this idea of potentially setting up a fake company that actually sells this technology but only to acquire interest and buy-in from prospective buyers and use that as research material. Um, so we would never on-sell it, but we would just capture information from companies to find out why they want to buy it, how they want to use it, what they're actually even willing to buy it for. And then ultimately, when, once we sit around the table with a contract, we would obviously not sign it and on-sell it. And now anything. you've blown your cover. There's a <laughs> camera right there. <laughs> All right, okay. <laughs> So actually, it's interesting, there's a case happening in California at the moment by a consumer group there um, uh, that's urging action because they found that different consumers online um, got different prices when they looked at online shopping. In fact, if you had a social media presence, um, you were going to get more of a discount than if you had zero presence online. And they actually said in their submission to the uh, government asking for investigation of this that the battle over whether people's personal data can be collected is over. Um, and as of this moment, consumers have lost. Consumers are now victims of an unavoidable corporate surveillance capitalism. And rather, their petition highlighted a disturbing evolution in how consumers' data 
is deployed against them. More questions? Yes, the gentleman down the front who wants the cube. Great. Um, question, uh, probably for the entire panel, but maybe more suited for you, Niels. Given that we keep seeing uh, a push for the national identity card in Australia, uh, how far off do you think it is until we see sort of facial recognition law enforcement occurring? Good question. Um, when we first launched Biometric Mirror, which is pretty much a year ago, um, a lot of media came to us and asked us that question as well, like, will we ever have a Chinese social credit system? And back then we were in the assumption that yes, it will happen, and I, I still think it will happen, but back then we said, yeah, give it five or 10 years and we'll have it. Um, and back then we already have it to some extent. You rate your Uber driver, they rate you. You rate your restaurant on Yelp, and we can imagine that perhaps the restaurant at some point will, will rate you as well as a, as a visitor. Um, so all of these are little steps to building that. Um, but then a couple of months ago, it turned out that Darwin had installed this city-wide or CBD-wide camera surveillance system. It was used during the Commonwealth Games most recently as well. I think Perth has a similar system as well. Melbourne, apparently, I wasn't aware. Uh, which streets, just so I can avoid them. I've been told it's actually a lot of the CBD has coverage, okay. so a good portion of it, in Good fact. thing we moved out of the CBD then. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it is happening and it will be there. Um, so initially we said five years, probably less. I think as, as soon as there is a market for surveillance capitalism or for surveillance, then yeah, every city will jump on board. Other questions? Yes, there's a lady just behind you. There you go. Hi, um, you've mentioned that this study or work you've used to prove that it's dangerous and it's not accurate, but are you, I mean, I could see other people arguing that, okay, well, we can learn from this and we can correct the information we've got there and then we store that. Is that part of your scope as well or are you finished with what you're doing there? We're not finished, we're, we've hardly started, but it's a really good question. It's a discussion we have within our group as well. So I work with um, a group of technical people, a lot of developers, um, a lot of people that have a significant background in AI, and we have this constant debate where they say, we should make it more accurate. We should make sure that the um, ethnicity is always right, or is 99% of the time right. Uh, so Carl, you wouldn't be African, you would be Caucasian. Um, whereas the other part of the group who are the, the social scientists and, and the human computer interaction people, they say, don't even bother. That's not the point. The point of things like this is to prove that things go wrong. Also, how accurate can you make it? We're talking about ethnicity in Biometric Mirror. It's a very different construct than the concept of race. Uh, there are hundreds of ethnicities and you might identify with multiple ethnic, ethnic groups, for instance. It's impossible to make such a thing accurate, and then we're not even talking about all the psychometrics. So we're not using any data to improve our system. That's not our ambition. Our ambition is to just use this as a sort of educational tool and uh, a tool for people to understand that there is this massive issue. But you're possibly running into the situation where you've made a deliberately false tool, which is then going to be seen as real. And I was reading of a case where a Democrat, so in America you have two political parties, there's the um, Republicans which correspond to our Conservative Party and the Democrats which correspond to our Conservative Party. And the two parties, <laughs> recently the Republicans won and on the lead up to the election, uh, a, a Democrat started making all sorts of absolutely outrageous, obviously wrong claims about how evil the Democrats were, hoping that this would then spur people to see how wrong they were, they were believed. So you know, Hillary Clinton eats babies for breakfast every second day and on the other days in between she fries them. You know? and, and, and people would believe that and it was actually believed, and he helped put this one forward, that she was running a pedophilia ring via a pizza shop in K Street in Washington, right? And that was believed and has been repeated over and over again. Where is truth, man? Only in the Venn diagram. <laughs> I, I think it's a really good point and with 
projects like Biometric Mirror, indeed, you're threading that really fine line between being ethical and being unethical and, and trying to make people make it clear to people that this is rubbish, but also trying to create this sense of trust and belief. And I think it's similar to what Black Mirror does. A lot of people probably still walk away from watching an episode and think, oh, yeah, Whoa. this is actually possible. Uh, and we did that for a reason, and we're conscious that some people might felt harmed after biometric mirror or after their, yeah, their scan. That's the line they like. They try to walk in black mirror is making a technology like cool enough and useful enough that people are like, I would want to use that. But then having the result be like unsettling enough that they kind of question that response. But that Charlie talks about that's what they're aiming for in every episode. Yeah. So I think the other thing to point out is that it's sort of rubbish, but it's sort of not because this is how a lot of people perceive these characteristics on your face. And it doesn't mean that it's true, but if thousands of people perceive it that way, it becomes a truth because that's how you'll get treated when you're dating or renting someone an apartment or hiring them for a job or giving them a loan. So it is a kind of truth even though it's not the real truth. It's a treatment truth. Yes, do we have someone back there? Go ahead. Um, so in the past 48 hours... Uh, speak into okay, your... Yeah, sorry. This Cute. feels weird holding a cue box to my face. <laughs> um, in the past 48 hours, everyone, I'm assuming, in here's social media feeds would have been flooded with images of people being aged up into their 60s, 70s, 80s, using that um, face app or whatever it's called. Obviously, that's been found out that that was a Russian startup um, with incredibly intense terms and conditions, which gives them complete use of that photo that you upload them for whatever purposes that they want. How much of a worry is something like that and a service that, a viral service that pops up that has unrestricted access to your biometric data? Do you have a Facebook account? Yes. I think Facebook is probably more concerning than FaceApp because they have access to all of your photos and probably more photos than you might have uploaded to FaceApp and they perform facial analysis on every single photo that you upload. Um, I think a lot of the claims about FaceApp have been um, refuted in the past couple of hours as well. Um, so it is indeed a Russian startup. They have servers, Amazon servers in the US. Um, they don't have access to your entire photo library and that was a claim that was once made as well that, that all of your photos are being uploaded. That's not happening. But look, I, I would never do it. Um, but I can see the point and I can see the value for some young people to actually do it and have fun, apparently rugby teams and football teams as well to do it. Um, but I think, yeah, networks like Facebook, they're way more concerning than uh, a simple app such as FaceApp. And can I just uh, foreshadow before we take some more questions, at 3.30 today in the science tent, there is a fantastic cyber hack panel, I know because I'm on it, but uh, we will actually be talking about some of these very issues uh, about tracking you on social media and how much people can learn from things such as your photos around social media. So come to the science tent at 3.30 today. Can we bounce that cube just behind you? And I know there's some questions over here as well, so we'll send the cube over to the other side of the room shortly. Hi, uh, I'm just, I'm conscious that the, the metrics that we've got from a single uh, photo... Hold the microphone up closer to your mouth. Sorry. Uh, the metrics that we've got from, a, from one photo are quite cross-sectional. When in day-to-day, -day our sociability, our emotion would change quite drastically. I'm wondering how the system accommodates for that, if at all, and then extending from that, uh, how it might accommodate for people with mental illness. It's a rubbish system. It doesn't accommodate for anything else or anything that's not seen on the photo of, of Dr. Carl at the moment. And in, in you know, the systems that are being put in place in China and other cities, do you know if there's any, uh, any leeway for that kind of thing? Look, uh, look, we have very little information about what's happening in China and how it works. I can only imagine that it works on real-time video. We're just poor researchers. We couldn't afford the real-time analysis API. We could only do the static API. But if anyone has funding, please talk to me later. <laughs> Um, but I can only hope that China has a slightly more advanced system, but we just don't know. Yeah. So one thing uh, that is worth noting is it's harder to capture accurate information about someone if it's a moving image than a still image. The accuracy rate is much lower, um, and so you need more funding to do that well. Accuracy is even lower. 
and, and one other factor to include, uh, keep in the background is that 1% of humans have psychopathic tendencies where they have no morals and don't care and are only kept in line by the laws of the society or their friends, if they have any. And where these psychopathic people end up in our society depends upon a two-by-two two grid of whether they're intelligent or not intelligent and violent or not violent. And so if you're intelligent and violent, you'll end up in the armed forces, the police forces, etc. If you're intelligent and non-violent, you'll end up running our Canberra? recruitment company that Brenna and I are setting up shortly. <laughs> exactly. Um, okay, can we get someone down the back who hasn't had a chance? Yes, just over here. Do I see a hand going up? Great. Um, I'm just curious, with these sorts of systems and programs, um, is there interest in like education, so from high schools and primary schools, for these sorts of things? Because I understand it would be especially problematic because children and teenagers are still developing and they're in positions of like teachers influen influencing students. Um, last year, uh, the facial recognition system was rolled out in schools on a test basis in China with regard to monitoring their attentiveness. And should they stop paying attention to the teacher, they would be reprimanded and lose some social credit. Oh, um, also, and colleagues, please stop live tweeting now, but it is in Australia as well. There's a startup in Melbourne that does exactly the same thing. So no live tweeting at the moment, please. Um, that does exactly the same thing, and I've been quite vocal about it, that mm. that shouldn't happen. I think young people should be able to throw things at each other in a classroom <laughs> and, and and get punished for that. I think that's fine. That's a and normal part. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Um, but it's indeed a system to, to track all of that kind of behaviour in a classroom, and it's pretty Part scary. of development, it's like in the episode of Black Mirror, like seeing things that uh, are p potentially detrimental in the moment are part of the development of the human. Seeing a dog that scares her or seeing pornography or knowing about violence or blood is important to the development of the child. And following on from that, with regard to the human brain, it starts off being fairly immature when you're born, of course, and it gets cooked in your middle, early 20s, when you start being really boring and want to go to bed at 10 o'clock instead of raging till 4 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and I think that there are grounds in our society that with regard to social media and the internet, you get a new identity when you start going to bed early. And all of the mistakes you made get wiped off because that was when you thought it was a really good idea to have a photo of you new, naked on the Great Wall of China or see how many beers you can drink or do shoeys. And all of, if you don't make a mistake, you don't do anything. And you've got to make mistakes. But there should be, I'm thinking, grounds for a line in the sand that says, OK, that's while your brain was still maturing. OK, now you've got a fresh start. And it doesn't come back to haunt you forever and ever. I mean, it is interesting in Victoria that the basis on which um, this uh, facial recognition system was being promoted was it would be faster and more efficient for the teachers just to do roll call attendance, right? So it's like, oh, well, if we just, because it's so difficult to read off 20 names, right? Um, that this would be imposed, and then, of course, it's a slippery slope into whether or not the children are responsible or sociable or introverted or aggressive down this, uh, down this slide. Okay, do we have some questions down the, we have a nice lady just here with her hand up, yes, in a white top, great. And then we'll go back to you. I'm just wondering how the Privacy Act ties into the collection and usage of this data in Australia. For biometric mirror specifically? Yeah. Uh, good question. Um, and I'll talk you through a few of the iterations that we've done with biometric mirror. So the first one was the research version, this exact same version. Um, and for that, we have to go through an ethics review at university. Um, and I won't say that the Privacy Act does not apply to that, but it's, it's looked at quite differently because it's considered research. Um, and, and that came back very positive. But then we were approached by Science Gallery to have a more artistic version of Biometric Mirror. Um, so we worked with an artist in Melbourne, Lucy McRae, um, who took this really boring interface really to the next level. And she made this science fiction beauty salon where people could walk into and step into and a host would take you through the entire experience. Um, and the final step, which we haven't brought with us today, is this facial perfection algorithm. So we 
developed an AI that transformed people's faces into what's considered a mathematically perfect face. Um, long story short, the idea there was that we would exhibit this in public space. Um, we had it set up in Swanston Street in front of the State Library in Melbourne um, with massive screens pointing towards Swanston Street. So people stood inside a glass cube, had their face scanned, but potentially hundreds of people in front of them could see that on, um, on Swanston Street, sorry. But if you're doing research in public space, all of a sudden you have to go through a privacy, what's called a privacy impact assessment, and there the Privacy Act applies. Um, and you can imagine that they came back to us um, with a, yeah, this massive list of requirements and do not do's, really. Um, so we had to temporarily interrupt collecting data for that version as well. Um, we had to make sure that there was a proper debrief procedure, consent procedures were very different. Science Gallery has an audience of 15 to 25 year olds, especially the 15 to 18 year group. That was a real challenge to have them involved in, in, in the experience. So we had to work through that whole list to yeah, address all of these requirements of the Privacy Act. Mm. Um, there was, uh, yes, yes, do you want to go ahead? Hello, hello. Well, first of all, thank you for the project. Very nice idea, uh, very clear. Um, but one may speculate that probably your input database wasn't large enough or wasn't accurate enough. Um, I, I won't go into this. Uh, maybe it could be made better, of course, uh, more perfect. But uh, when I looked at this, to me, it looked more like um, reading your fate from your palm, that something that people has been doing for centuries, right? And they still keep doing this. So what I see is that technology here is an example, a good example of how technology can be used in the wrong way, right, badly. Uh, but it is not going to prevent other people from using this. Um, there is another downside of this. When you start promoting these ideas, someone can really perceive this as an opportunity because I work for the industry that uh, protect people from malware, from viruses and computer threats. And I see a lot of people willing to do this on purpose just exploit weaknesses of others. So when we do talk about threats, usually we have this precaution of not actually spreading the idea to the evil minds. So whatever you send the next warning, like this or um, in the future, uh, please consider that somebody can actually use it as a business opportunity. That's my little note, that's all. But, but wouldn't yeah. they be using it as a business opportunity anyway, with or without biometric mirror? I wanna contest that as well, I think, there's one option to remain quiet about it and never do things like biometric mirror, or there's another opportunity to actually go out there and communicate proactively and try to address a large crowd. And Carl, you're here, I think we reached 200 million people with biometric mirror. Um, so we've reached a massive amount of people that now know that there is such a thing as uh, yeah, unethical AI, and there is a thing that you should be more concerned about how computers are used to analyze you and are used against you. Um, so I, I'm not in the camp of remaining quiet about it. If anything, I think we should all, as researchers and as industry people, we should be more vocal uh, about showing all of the issues and all of the challenges. So it's a good, it's a good question, though, because it's a tool that has, in a sense, a dual use. So it's worth a debate and discussion uh, about that. Do we have a couple of other questions as well? We can pass the cube. Anyone else put their hand up? Or are you guys awfully quiet? Oh, we've got a gentleman down the front just here. If you can toss the cube to the front row. I know you've been waiting patiently. Yeah, Dr. Carl, if, if I'm correct, and I hope it's not too intrusive, but I think I heard a podcast where you said you had facial agnosia or something like that. I, I cannot recognise faces. It's called prosopagnosia. To me, they look like bricks in a wall. The way I discovered this was that I was in first year medicine as a mature age student. And halfway through the year, two students came up to me and said, what's my name? And I said, you're John. And the other guy said, well, what's my name? And I said, well, you're John too. And they said, don't you think that's a bit of a coincidence? I said, yeah, now you mention it. And they said, can you pick the difference between us? And I looked at them and gradually it came through that they were both tall, young, Caucasian males with red hair. And then suddenly I said, oh, you've got glasses. And he said, yes, I'm Stuart. He's John. And I couldn't pick it. Second example, I was at a um, conference. Uh, I was at a, a comedy workshop, three-day weekend, 500 bucks. Honestly, best investment I made. Um, 
and I thought, gee, I, I know that guy. Uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, oh, Sunday I went up and said, hi, g'day, my name's Carl, I think we've met. And he said, yes, I was your producer on the TV show Sleek Geeks where we were together every day, six days a week, for the last six months except for the last month. <laughs> and as he said that, his face sort of morphed from sort of fuzzy and I said, Brendan. And he said, yeah. Yes. I have prosopagnosia. I probably need facial recognition. Hi, this is Sulette. Hello, Sulette. Oh, Brenna. Hi, Neil's lovely to hear. Well, well, that was really my question. Like, is there some good application of this where you could have a little thing on, I don't know, maybe you don't want it, but it seems yeah, like yeah. it could actually tell. If it gives me Neil's yeah. credit card number and the pin, I'd love it. <laughs> Very good. We'll take one last question if there's anyone else who's got any last question. Was that a hand over there? Yeah, go ahead. One last question and then we'll wrap up and do come. I've got a couple of announcements uh, as well before we go. This one's kind of a hypothetical, I guess. Um, you made that with like a connect, right? So what's stopping people putting this in like an iPhone 10, which has facial recognition stuff? and using it for like advertising by Facebook, like choosing if someone's vulnerable to buying certain products? Nothing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's a shopping mall chain in Australia that has similar technology. I'm not sure if they distinguish your attractiveness and sociability, but if you walk into a Westfield shopping center, um, it's highly likely that you walk past one of the advertising screens. Most of them have cameras inside and the advertising can change according to your gender or age or whatever, or your emotion. Um, so yeah, apparently nothing stops people from implementing it everywhere. Don't hang out in shopping malls maybe? Is that your advice? <laughs> or on the internet or on anywhere. Internet. Or <laughs> anywhere, wear a mask, wear a gorilla mask. Um, before we say goodbye to our panel today, can I just remind you of a couple of interesting things? So on Friday, Saturday and Sunday in the science tent at 11.45 each day and 2.30 each day, you can come and be scanned by a biometric mirror with the data not kept. It will tell you all about how you are perceived. Be brave, go bring your friends. Um, there will be this terrific session on today at 3.30 in the science tent on cyber hacking. At 10 a.m. tomorrow morning, there's another AI, artificial intelligence panel on here for those of you who don't stay up really late with Tame Impala. Um, and that's the future of jobs in an artificial intelligence world. We also have an excellent panel for that. I recommend coming. Um, there's a terrific team of volunteers down the back who are um, providing information on information table about the humanitarian campaign to bring Julian Assange home to Australia. Stop by the table on your way out for information. Can I thank our wonderful panelists today for a great discussion. <laughs> and feel free to come up afterwards. We'll come down and have a chat with the creators of Biometric Mirror uh, and Brenna and Dr. Carl as well. Thank you. <laughs>